What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Guys, I just realized we probably should have saved this episode for um, the week of the year that's themed after what we're doing, Um, but it's sharks. (laughs) When when is Shark Week? I don't actually know. When is... I feel like it's in the summer, because that seems appropriate. Yeah, I think it is in the summer. Hey, actually, we're recording in the in in the past, so maybe no. maybe this episode lands on the actual Shark Week. We're recording like a week in the past. <laughs> no, it's August. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like it's not it's not we're not we're not that on top of things. <laughs> that may have been the fastest I've ever gone from starting the episode to googling something on air. <laughs> it's pretty impressive, actually. And being wrong, <laughs> <laughs> made it through like a whole like three sentences. <laughs> so, like I said, our question this week is shark related. It is. What if you could perfectly train sharks? And we've done a couple episodes now where we're trained different types of animals. And what we mean by training is basically you can control and teach them to do things. So they can understand your commands. They'll generally follow them and you can use them to do whatever you want that would be within their normal abilities. And we, we made the distinction where like you can control them, I guess, but they still have free will. So they can do they can still do whatever they want. But you can basically teach them to have the ability to do something. Yeah, like like an exceptionally smart dog kind of level of being able to obey commands and things. And I imagine it's a fairly friendly relationship, so they'll they'll probably do what you want them to. Yeah, that too. Which is good for sharks because if the answer was well, you could trade, you could try and train them, but they would eat you, is not a real great answer. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. And what I really wanted to go in with, you know. Sharks do lots of cool things. They're big. They have lots of sharp teeth. They eat lots of things. But that's not super helpful. So I was kind of looking what else sharks can do besides just fish stuff. And where the rabbit hole I kind of went down is sharks have a sixth sense. So everyone knows that sharks smell really, really good. Well, they they can smell very good. <laughs> they probably they don't smell wonderful. smell good because they live <laughs> in the ocean. So I imagine they smell like... Mm, briny water smell but in addition to all their other good senses that they have they have a sixth one um which is electroreception so basically it's an ability that sharks have where they can sense electromagnetic fields and they can use this to hunt their prey what's interesting is this isn't like some auxiliary like Oh, I have a v- like I feel a vague thing sometimes, and you know I can kind of see where magnetic north is or something like birds have, where it's just kind of they have it, but it's basically useless. This is actually a really acute sense that they have, and they u- like it's one of their primary senses that they use to hunt. So like some of the things that they can do. One example is the great white sharks. They'll actually can use this to find stingrays that are buried under the sand, so they can actually sense through electromagnetism where the stingrays are without smelling them or seeing them or anything else and it's even sensitive enough that they can like detect the electrical signal released by like muscle motions in fish so like specific like movements of fish will attract them and like even just the existence of fish in the water like animal cells give off enough of a pulse for some sharks to pick it up like um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, but it doesn't really mean anything to anybody because there's not really many comparison points. But the sharks can detect signals on the order of nanovolts per centimeter. So like, the example they claim is that this is the equivalent of detecting a you know a D cell battery that's ten thousand miles away. That seems unlikely. Which I'm sure works in some kind of equation, but I'm equally sure does not work if you do something crazy like consider the rest of physics that would apply in that well, scenario. Also, like, I feel like most sharks are probably within 10,000 miles of at least one D-cell battery. <laughs> and they're not going crazy all the time. You have like a Superman, Superman hearing problem where you hear everyone. Right. <laughs> but no, so, but they do have actually, it is actually like a crazy level of sensitivity. And what it is is that they pick it all up, but they only respond to the stuff they're, you know, naturally inclined to 
respond to. Like, the, they have, they know specifically the pattern for a stingray or for fish, and they can pick that up out of the noise in some pretty crazy, like, some pretty crazy scenarios. Like, it's it's actually, like, a really, really honed sense. I wonder how we discovered this. Um, there's, there's actually, there's actually a couple interesting, like, case studies for it. I think they first noticed it by how they hunted the stingrays under the, under the sand. Hmm. Um, you can also see they have, like, the receptors they use are, like, pretty much go across, like, their whole face. So if you dissect a shark, you can actually kind of see, um, like, just from that autopsy, you can pick up, like, oh, what are these organs doing? Is this part of the reason that sharks attack the internet? Yes, actually. Yay! So, yeah, if you don't know, the the underground internet cables that carry all the internet from shore to shore that are just entirely unprotected and sitting on the ocean floor, sometimes sharks, they have a problem where sometimes the sharks attack them, and it's because they release this um, this light magnetic field. It's like yelling into Superman's ears. So he gnaw, so he gnaws on you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple other ones, too. Like, they had one, they had, like, a... A juvenile shark in captivity that they were trying to use to to take care of and like based on the like mechanical equipment outside the tank the shark would just always bump into this one wall and they actually had to just like release the shark because in order to to move that equipment it was too expensive so they just like were like well the shark can't do it so they took <laughs> that shark away but yeah very cool very cool ability and there's lots of applications of being able to sense electromagnetic fields, but not many of them to do in the ocean. So first things first, let's look at getting our shark pals out of the ocean and onto land. So sharks are, the cooler sharks are not great at uh, captivity. Like the, a lot of the information I found is from uh, great whites because I think it's easier to get funding to study great white sharks because people think they're cool. I mean, great is right there in the name. Like, makes sense. Yeah, but they're not... A super ideal shark for our purposes um, because they don't fare well in captivity. They actually tried a, a whole bunch of times to, you know, keep great white sharks in captivity, but the longest they had had one survive is just 198 days, and this is like with juvenile sharks. There's a couple of problems. One, they're very big, um, so you need like exponentially more and more space for them to roam around. They just like behaviorally get like don't like it. And a problem for adult great white sharks is that their diet consists of, like, big sea animals. And there's not too many, like, sea lions that are available for, like, feeding purposes uh, in a general aquarium setting. So great white sharks are probably not our ideal shark if we're trying to take them out of the ocean. Plus, even though they have pretty good electroreception, they're not the best at it. Hammerhead sharks actually have a good edge on great whites. And part of the reason that their head evolve so wonky shaped is that it gives them a bigger surface area to use this electroreception ability so that's part of the reason the hammerhead shark's head is so wonky shaped and because of that they're able to pick up signals actually three times better than great whites can um, hammerheads also do much better in captivity and are actually available to see in a bunch of different aquariums so you can take it out of the ocean and put in a tank but we don't want to really just build a huge tank that's stationary where we have our shark because that doesn't really accomplish too much for us so the trick with sharks is that as you may know they, they may they have to keep swimming in order to breathe because they have they need water continuously passing over their gill you know through their mouth over their gills so that there's a fresh oxygen supply in the water for them i think we said some of them not all right yeah not all of them there there are cases of some sharks that will act are able to just to take water in their mouth and use their mouths to push the water over their gills so they can rest at the bottom. Some sharks are very good at like holding their breath. Some sharks just like are smaller and just have a less demand for oxygen. So they don't need quite to do, be quite as fast or consistently moving. But I was expecting kind of a complicated procedure on how to keep these shar sharks like oxygenated. And then I realized all you need is one of those, um, those endless pools, like the, like the, the pool treadmills. The infinity pool. Yeah. Yeah, I kept searching an infinity pool and it wasn't what I wanted because infinity oh. pools are just the ones where the water goes it over the drops off. end oh, of yeah, a building and it looks like it goes on forever. No, um, it's endless pools are the one where there's a continuous current. And so I was looking up how complicated those are if you were trying to, say, make a cool shark car where you could have a constant flow of water with a shark. And it's not that complicated. It's literally just a turbine. So it literally just sucks water in and pumps it through and around. And I don't know why I expected it to be more complicated, but you can pretty easily make a little self-contained little shark car. It's just a water fan. Yeah, exactly. I'm just seeing the Pope Mobile, but with a shark in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was imagining. Yes, I love it. 
and from here you can start doing some cool stuff like now that you have it on land um you can do things like how they detect stingrays you can bring them on the beach and you can do like um like male detection and comb the beach with your shark which is way cooler of a hobby and i'm sure just as effective <laughs> yeah it, it might be more i think it would be generally more effective oh. the the trick with male detection is that the metal stuff under the sand doesn't emit a signal so you need to bounce a signal off it so you'd have to have a thing on the shark car that generates a, a pulse and i wasn't i didn't go into how much of a pulse you need to generate for how, it. how would the shark communicate to you that there's metal uh it would smile <laughs> <laughs> okay i like it a smile and a wink i don't know i approve and, there, and there's some more like actual good you know good work you could do like uh you could do landmine detection they would be – sharks are definitely sensitive enough to pick up um, the signal from landmines. The only trick with that is that they already have animals to do that. Rats have been trained to pick up landmines by smell. Um, even though I think a shark's, a shark's senses are broader and they could do, like, a quicker job of it, rats have the advantage of not triggering the mines when they stand on them and find them. <laughs> it's pretty important. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to leave it to the rats. Plus, they already gave one a medal. So, it's like you can't even – like, that's just too much competition. Plus – it's not going far enough for what I want to do because we can get them on the land. But a couple weeks back, or was it just last week that we did the, uh, the we talked about digital data being lost? Was that the, just the, this previous episode? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about digital data being lost and I dipped my toes into airplane navigation. So I was worried back with digital data being lost that if you lost all the maps and stuff, all the planes wouldn't be able to know where they're going. And it turns out there's a lot of live um, information being broadcast to help planes na to navigate. And, you know, the, the signals get sent out, plane reads the signal, spits out the information to the pilot, on where to go, and then they follow that. But sharks don't need any of those stinking machines to pick up those types of uh, radio and electromagnetic signals. They can just sense the original signal directly. So my question is, can a shark fly a plane? <laughs> <laughs> First thing we're going to do is put the shark in the plane. We're just going to take our endless pool, put it in the cockpit, or... I guess you could also put it underneath in luggage because the shark doesn't really need to see. It's not really going to be using that as one of its primary senses. I imagine you don't, you don't want anyone to see the shark. That also might be good. Yeah, just have a fo like a faux pilot in the cockpit and like the shark <laughs> is the like real a pilot. I, I've seen, you guys have seen Airplane, right? Yeah, yes. of course. The, uh, the, the inflatable uh, <laughs> like, uh, autopilot. Yeah, inflatable co-pilot. <laughs> yeah, just that. That's up there waving. Yeah, exactly. And I think controlling the plane can also be, like, sharkified, I guess you could say. And you can even do a shortcut because you can just have your control panel there emit signals. And some of those, like, small electrical signals, like the ones of, like, fish muscles and things, are actually, like, trigger an attack response in the shark. So you could have, you know, buttons or pulleys that would, you know, would trigger off when the shark needs to pull them to, uh, to train them how to actually control the shark. The plane. Control the plane. Control the plane. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so really the big thing that I wanted to answer was, can the shark pick up all these signals that I wanted to pick up? And can it navigate without the aid of being able to, you know, without having to go through the machines? So the trickiest part of plane flying is actually, is the takeoff and landing. And that's actually the easiest because the airports will actually triangulate a couple signals to kind of shoot a radio like a path with radio signals of where the plane should be taking off and landing from so it's pretty easy for a shark to pick that up it's a, it's, it's a fairly strong signal sharks not gonna have any problem picking that up shark can just follow that to take off and land the plane but once you're up in the air um, and navigating like big scale is the next question so what do pilots use to navigate the first two i've paired together are called pilotage and dead reckoning this is human stuff. Um, this is basically using landmarks and that's pilotage, like using landmarks to navigate and dead reckoning is picking two landmarks and then estimating how fast you're going by how quickly you go between those two landmarks. Why did we call it that? Um, because I think dead reckoning is like... It was a nautical term, right? It was... Yeah, reckoning is like direction and dead, like a dead reckoning would be like this thing you're aiming towards is your dead reckoning, like... It's because it's sitting there dead in the water, kind of. Okay. I'm, I'm Googling it now. No, so so Dead Reckoning. Dead Reckoning is, um, this is what I thought it was. I'm glad I confirmed it. So when you're on a ship, usually what you do is you find your position by like looking at the stars. But um, sometimes it's cloudy or, you know, during the day. <laughs> and you still kind of want to know where you are. So Dead Reckoning is basically 
you have your point in the past where you know where you were and you have an estimate of what direction you're going and how fast you're going. And based on how much time has passed, you can estimate where you currently are. So as long as you keep track over time of where you've been, you can sort of assume where you are based on that prior information. Oh, so your 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 dead landmark is basically where you started the day. Yeah. Or I think I think the idea is that oh, let me click this link that's why is it called dead reckoning i thought that's what you were going to explain oh because the term is is a sailing term it's it's old as all butts yeah so <laughs> it sounds right and it sounds cool and we're just gonna use it it's, it's invo- it involves being involves being dead in the water is the idea yeah anyway like i said that's the human stuff our shark's not gonna be doing those the second thing that planes use is basically on the ground signals so there's what they what they call non-directional beacons and vhf omnidirectional ranges so basically non, non-directional non beacons are literally just a tower or a facility that emits a signal that a plane can pick up. And it's just a constant radio signal that just goes out. And based on how close you are to that signal, you can guess, you can figure out where you are. This is mostly used for like offshore locations where you just got to get kind of close. Like if you have just one non-directional beacon, like if you're following that signal strength, you kind of end up spiraling around it a little bit. It's hard to get like a direct path to it. But meanwhile, it's kind of sister component is this VHF omnidirectional range, which is like the non-directional beacons, but it uh, it, alt- it changes its signal up to better signify um, direction locations. And these ones are actually scattered. There's about a thousand of these locations scattered around the U.S. So you could actually use these to get around. So with the omnidirectional ranges, our shark could theoretically do basic navigation around the country. But of course... That's not actually what planes use. What they use is GPS. This is the best and primary way to navigate. It's what planes use. The thing with GPS, of course, is that the signal isn't like a big radio tower sending out this, you know, local high energy wave. It's coming from the little GPS satellites out in space. So my question becomes, can a shark detect that GPS signal with its uh, hypersensitive hammerhead? So a GPS satellite emits 44.8 watts of power, which really doesn't sound like a lot to me. (laughs) And they fly um, in like a mid-orbit 20,000 kilometers above the Earth. So first off, that doesn't feel like that works in general to me. But again, I don't (laughs) understand this luxury stuff all that great. Um, And what I tell you, I don't understand at all, which drove me nuts, was units for electricity and signal strength and this kind of thing is horrible. It's like, goes through decibels for a reason I cannot fathom. (laughs) Like, it's like decibel watts, and I spent probably a good half an hour just trying to figure out what the hell that meant, like, conceptually. And then found some equations to help me track to, that literally was answering my exact question that helped me get through it. So, basically, you have to convert what the GPS is emitting into an electrical field strength, and then carry that over the distance down to earth so i did some calculations to roughly calculate the electrical field strength to compare it to the sensitivity of the shark so the signal strength of a gps is generally 3.956 times 10 to the negative fourth nanovolts per centimeter a hammerhead can detect signals as low as 0.4 nanovolts per centimeter so basically four times 10 to the negative fourth versus four times 0.4 so we're basically the signal is 100 times weaker than we would need it to be to have our hammer detect it, which sucks because now we can't actually have our shark naturally use GPS. But the biggest thing affecting the signal strength is distance. So these GPS satellites are really far out there. So if we switch from that mid-orbit to like a typical low Earth orbit for some GPS satellites, we can go from our 20,000 kilometer orbit to a 640 kilometer orbit, which boosts our signal strength by just over a hundred times and put us into the detection range of our hammerhead shark. So basically if you bring in some low orbit satellites, you can create a GPS system that can be read by sharks anywhere in the world. And they will have a perfect GPS tracking wherever they are. And they literally could not get lost. <laughs> Global positioning sharks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
And that's how you do it. You just have to make some. You just have to bring some satellites in a little closer, and you can have your sharks fly the planes. And planes look like sharks. They don't look like hammerhead sharks, though. Not yet. I'm sure that's aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. If you if you made a if you made a hammerhead shark shape on the front, it would generate lift, which admittedly might be not ideal. <laughs> but <it laughs> that's is still, that's exactly what uh, I understand. Aeronautical engineers are looking for is not ideal, not ideal. shapes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they train for friends <laughs> all right that's that's my nonsense chris what's your nonsense <laughs> so when i found out we were gonna train sharks i didn't i couldn't really decide what i wanted to do at first so i kind of just started looking at big sharks because i'm like i'm sure that'll lead somewhere big sharks are cool so i looked up the largest shark in the world and it is the whale shark so male whale sharks average around 26 to 30 inches uh 30 feet long <laughs> not inches <laughs> 30 30 inch long whale shark guys watch out yeah and then females average around 48 feet long but then they get bigger than that because that's just an average so there are reports that whale sharks or there are there are reports of a whale shark up to 59 feet long jesus which is a little longer than a bowling lane so just imagine a shark that's the size of a bowling lane I feel like the bowling lane is, is a hard one to imagine because bowling lanes, I think, look a lot smaller than they are. You never see them from the right angle. Yeah. They look smaller because you're looking at them straight ahead. Much like whale sharks. 60 <laughs> feet, like 60 feet, like it's two houses on top of each other, like two two-story homes stacked on top of each other. Yeah. With the roof line. Like that's, now look up at that and that's, that's a shark. shark. And so there's a reported 40 foot long whale shark that, and they measured its mouth. Its mouth is five feet wide, which is huge. And I imagine the bigger ones have bigger mouths, so it's probably probably bigger than five feet. And inside these mouths are 300 rows of teeth, which is super intimidating for a giant shark with 300 rows of teeth. I got a little scared, but then I didn't have to worry because apparently they don't use these teeth to eat. And they're like super tiny teeth because they don't actually chew or anything. So they what they do is they filter feed. So they eat krill, they eat fish eggs, larvae, other types of plankton. Sometimes they eat smaller fish and like squid. But the way they do this, they use two different techniques. So one technique is called ram filtration, where they basically just open their mouth and then swim around and whatever goes in their mouth is filtered and they eat it. Ram filtration sounds like something my laptop needs. <laughs> <laughs> you want to filter your ram? It's too busy. It's too it's too dirty. <laughs> I need to clean up my ram. Get a whale shark. <laughs> and then the second technique is called active suction feeding, where they open their mouth, they suck in the water, and then they close their mouth and they expel the water through their gills. And both of these techniques do basically do the same thing. They filter, they separate the food from the water using 20, they have 20 filter pads in their mouth. So they do what's called cross flow filtration where the water flows parallel to the pads and anything that gets caught in the filter they eat it and then the the water flows through it and it, it gets expelled and it can filter out anything larger than two around two millimeters wow that's pretty that's pretty like precise actually yeah so two millimeters is around it's just a little larger than the width of a spaghetto so if you didn't know, spaghetti, spaghetto is the singular of spaghetti. I did not know, but Wait, I assume so. I was wondering why you were saying that. Like, <laughs> is this some weird like, fucking brand of spaghetti I never heard of? I like the idea that it was just you not knowing how spaghetti-o was pronounced. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, <yeah, say> a spaghetto. <laughs> the thing we all loved as kids. Spaghettos. So they filter feed. And filter feeders are actually what they call ecosystem engineers. And that basically just means that they have a significant effect on the ecosystem. So... Um, when they filter feed, they alter the clarity of the water and like the amount of light penetration, which ultimately affects the uh, the depth at which photosynthesis happens, which is pretty important. So that's why they're considered ecosystem engineers. And there are three types of filter feeding sharks or three species of filter feeding sharks. There's the whale shark, which is what we're talking about now. There's the basking shark. Which they look really cool. If you look at pictures of basking sharks, they're like always with their mouths open. You can like see. There's like. I don't actually know if it's like their skeleton, but it looks like a skeletal pattern inside their mouth. I didn't actually oh. look into it because I wasn't researching the basking shark. Oh, God. I'm looking at it now and it's. 
It's like it's yelling at me, and I don't yeah. like it. And then the third one is the Mega Mouth Shark, which has a big mouth. <laughs> when they ran out of shark names for sharks with big mouths. Yeah, actually, I mean all these all these sharks have big mouths, which is because they filter feed. This, the Mega Mouth Shark does not look at table. It, it looks, looks like so someone derpy. drew a shark poorly. Yeah. It's like a children's drawing of a shark that someone has turned into a live animal. It really right. is. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's it's also the smallest of the three. Actually, no, a better description, it's a shark wearing a retainer. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's accurate. what this looks like. Ironically, it kind of looks like an airplane. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, all sharks look like airplanes. Well, yeah. So, yeah, all these have really big mouths. So I was like, okay, can I, like, do something with these big mouths? And I was like... <laughs> Maybe I can, like, use them for storage or something. That was my first thought. And, like, I swim around and carry things in the mouth. <laughs> or, like, if I, like, do a heist or something, I could, like, conceal something in their mouth. Actually, part of my research was looking into if there are underwater museums that I could steal stuff from. There are. And they mostly have, like, statues and sculptures and stuff. So I was like, maybe I could, like hide one of these statues in the mouth <laughs> it's kind of lame though <laughs> and I, they're probably pretty heavy i don't actually know if they'd be able to lift one of these statues so i ditched that idea i was like okay maybe i could like ride inside the mouth of a shark because that sounds cool <laughs> and safe and safe they're not gonna eat me you already established that'd be a bad answer <laughs> <laughs> so i don't i don't really want to do that either it's kind of I couldn't actually, f I, I tried to look to see how much volume they could actually carry in their mouth, but I couldn't find the depth of their mouth. I, they only listed the width of the mouth. So I don't know how far back their mouth goes. I don't know how much they can carry. So I didn't really go that route either. The next route I, I thought about was maybe doing some sort of sport or something because the, the whale shark's mouth is five feet wide and or at least the, the biggest recorded one, they probably get bigger than that. And a hockey goal is six feet wide. So I was like, maybe I could use it as a hockey goal and play hockey with sharks. Shocky. But I mean, like, that's really only using a big mouth as a, like, that doesn't really seem like I'm utilizing the whale shark to its fullest potential. I'm completely ignoring the filter feeding part of it. <laughs> And just using a big mouth. Just to check, Chris, because I don't, I don't know if this is true or not. Are you aware there is actually a hockey team called the Sharks? I am. Okay, cool. <laughs> just wanted to make sure we had that in there. <laughs> uh, where was I? So what did you do? <laughs> oh yeah, I want. To, so I want to use the filter feeding in some capacity because I didn't want to just ignore that. That's how I found these sharks in the first place. So I was like, okay, how can I use filter feeding? So it doesn't really work like I'm not like sieving for gold. So I don't get the gold if I'm like filtering it out. I get the the liquids and the solids are digested and I lose those. So I was trying to think of what to do and I came up with giant tea bag. <laughs> <laughs> so you could place a shark in a pool, put a whole bunch of tea leaves in the shark's mouth. The shark, I don't know if the shark will digest the tea leaves or not, maybe, but all the liquids will get filtered out through the gills <laughs> and it'll be tea and you can turn the pool into tea. And you may be asking, why can't you just achieve this with a normal giant tea bag? And you can, but the giant tea bag isn't going to be swimming around and naturally stirring your tea, <laughs> which is what the shark would be doing. Yeah, like, ram-filtrated tea is just way better than regular steeped tea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is this is the tea equivalent of the coffee that that, like, wombat poops out or whatever. Right, I don't know what you're talking about, but sure. <laughs> Wait, how have we not talked about this on this podcast? We probably did, I just don't remember anything, so. So there's there's this coffee, it's the world's most expensive coffee, uh, Kopi Luwak, and it's made from coffee beans that are eaten by this it's it looks kind of like a little like it's like a little uh i don't know rodent of some kind it looks kind of like a 
little like weasel i don't know it eats the coffee beans like a squirrel plus yeah it eats the coffee beans and then digests them and they ferment in its guts and it poops them out and they make coffee from them oh i think i've seen videos of people having this coffee yeah i don't know why it's a thing apparently it doesn't taste very good who knows <laughs> they do it anyway they do it my anyway. shark idea is better <laughs> so there are two problems with my shark my shark tea bag idea only just two. two just the two <laughs> So the first problem is that sharks are saltwater sharks. So my tea has to be salty. <laughs> they can't survive in freshwater. So there are there are two species of, of freshwater sharks. There's a river shark and the bull shark. And neither of them filter feed. So I, I have to have my sharks in salt water. And I actually tried looking into if there were like salty tea like types. I wanted to see if that was a thing. And what I found is noon chai is what uh, it's called noon chai and noon means salt in like a few Indian languages. So it's like a salty tea and it's made from green tea leaves, salt, milk and baking soda. So we could make this in our pool. It will be probably way saltier than it's supposed to be because ocean water is super salty and probably not actually drinkable <laughs> well you know what we could do is we could we could we could experiment we could um you know get some salt water from the ocean we're, we're in boston we're not too far we can get the other ingredients put them in and then make ben drink it on the behind the scenes <laughs> yeah you can have some noon chai and we don't you don't have to make it with a shark you can just make it normally <laughs> ben, yeah ben you'll be in charge of getting the whale shark to, to <laughs> Great. steep the tea and the second problem is that this tea has to be hot and we don't want to cook our shark because that's a waste of a shark. So turns out giant shark tea bag is a stupid idea. Who would have thunk? <laughs> so I came back to the original question. What would I do if I could perfectly train a shark? Um, Probably ride it. I don't know. Nice. They do say that I think I think specifically whale sharks do allow, like allow human riders fairly often. So I don't even need this special ability. That was a waste. <laughs> yeah, no, you just, you just, you're squandering it. You're telling me I could spend my whole life riding sharks and no one let me know? I'm letting you know now. It's only been, well, hopefully not your whole life. Hopefully you right. get through this recording. Anyway, Ben, what did you do? So my answer, to, to explain why I did this, I had to try to explain partially how we got to this question. So a few episodes back, we, we did an episode where we basically mashed up two questions from the prior year. It was like a year end thing. And I was convinced at the time that we had done already training sharks and was all excited about my answer and then realized, you know, like halfway through playing it that we hadn't ever actually done that question. I made up my mind. <laughs> it feels like a question we had done already. I could have though. sworn we had done it. I think all three of us just assumed that we did. Right. You yeah. pitched the idea to us and you're like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, come on. Um, so basically what I want to do is make baseball more interesting by putting sharks in it. My rationale for this is actually even dumber than you might expect, which is that the biggest problem with baseball is that for most of it, everyone just stands around all the time. And as Marcus mentioned, <laughs> sharks usually have to move all the time so they can keep breathing. So if we just put sharks in there, everyone has to move and things are Immediately better. Immediately better. Just by adding sharks. Who would have guessed? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this causes some problems. And we're going to have to figure out if baseball can work as a sport while, you know, riding sharks. So I figured I'd sort of take it, you know, one step at a time. So first off, uh, pitching. The issue we're going to hit here is that obviously everyone has to be riding a shark, and that includes the pitcher. And pitchers generate a lot of their power uh, from their legs. You know, they the way a pitcher's windup works is almost like, like a trebuchet where they, you know, load up power in their legs and then sort of fling themselves and their arm around to where their hand winds up moving, you know, 90 to 100 miles per hour. Uh, so I wanted to figure out if, you know, while say on a shark, we could still reach an, an MLB pitch speed. So sharks can swim roughly 30 miles per hour in short bursts. Uh, so I figure if we give, if we give the pitcher a, and his shark a swimming start, all we have to do <laughs> is get to like 50 to 70 miles per hour without using our legs throwing a baseball. And I thought that was doable. Now, the problem is it was actually remarkably hard to find information on how fast an MLB player can throw a baseball while sitting down. 
<laughs> I thought I'd be able to find this. I don't know why I was so convinced I'd be able to find this just on the internet, but I couldn't. All the links I found were just like drills for kids who play baseball to do to make them pitch better. I don't know. And I was going to just sort of, you know, make an assumption that if we just take off however much percentage, I would say it would work. And then literally while I was eating dinner tonight, I was doing some last Googling, trying to, you know, think of some combination of words to, uh, to make it work. And I found a YouTube video just called MLB throws while sitting down, which is just five and a half minutes of baseball players throwing, you know, who like feel the ball and then are sitting down and they have to get the ball to first base or whatever. And they just throw it while sitting just a bunch of those throws. So I sat down after dinner and timed them. So that's why you mess- messaged us and asking if we could record 30 minutes. Yes, later. I asked for an extra half an hour so I could spend actually about 45 minutes because this was around 740 at the time. You know, 45 minutes timing baseball players throwing while sitting. Um, I timed a bunch of them, about 10. I found ones where I could, you know, cleanly see where the ball left their hand and reached the uh, reach first base and where I could roughly tell how far it was going just by using, you know, baseball field dimensions. The lowest I saw was about 52 miles per hour. The fastest was about 62 and the average about 58. So assuming that 30 miles per hour, you know, burst speed from a shark, we are totally in still baseball pitching speed. If we have the pitcher just do a run up on his shark, which is also going to, I'm going to say this, look cool as hell. Yeah, the, the pitcher's mound is now like a final ramp where your shark like, exactly, jumps yeah. out of fucking water at 30 miles an hour. Exactly. It looks sick. So the ball is in the air. How are we going to hit it? That's, you know, question two pretty clearly. Oh, Ben, cool idea. Just, I just, just the mental image. I want this in here. You know how, you know how in soccer penalty kicks, they'll, they'll sometimes do like fake outs where like four people run up to it and not kick it. That, but pitching with sharks. So I, I thought about that. So I, didn't, I wasn't going to go like too far down this rabbit hole. I was tr- going to try to figure out what, um, so in baseball, if a pitcher starts to pitch and then doesn't pitch, that's a balk and it's bad and you get penalized for it. I was trying to figure out what that would entail with a shark run up and I decided not to go down that road. I feel like that would, that would probably fall under those rules though, Marcus. My apologies. I didn't know there was a rule against it already. Yeah. I feel like it's probably, <laughs> there's probably not a rule specifically saying some other player can't come stand by the pitcher while he pitches. It's just a really bad idea. But <laughs> anyway, how do we actually hit the ball? Because in my mind, what we're going to do is have like a great white, white shark there with a guy on its back. And the shark's going to swing around and slap the ball with its tail. And it's going to be awesome. So I was really hoping that sharks actually did that for some reason. And unfortunately, they don't. They don't just like spin around and hit things with their tails because that would have been cool. But there is one particular shark that does something maybe cooler. There's a shark called the thresher shark. Uh, which is, it's it's a really interestingly sort of shaped shark because that's this very long and um, like pointed, I guess, up tail that's frequently almost as long as the shark body itself is. And the way it hunts is it finds like like schools of sardines and basically whips them with its tail to just stun slash kill them and then just eat the stunned and dead fish afterwards. It sadly does not whip around in a circle the way, you know, you would swing a bat. What it does is arguably cooler, which is charge full speed at them, then basically, you know, break in the water and whip its tail up and forward (laughs) overhead. So I was wondering, the average, you know, bat speed of an elbow batter is like 70 and 90 miles per hour. And the researchers who were able to like observe this practice, you know, out in the wild were able to, to measure the speed. And the average is about 30, which is, you know, a little slow, obviously. But the fastest they saw was 80, which is right there in the middle. And I figured, you know, this is Major League Baseball. We'll be using, of course, only the best sharks. So we can get that 80 miles per hour pretty clearly. So what that's, this does mean, though, is that the batter also is going to have a run up. And now the actual pitch is basically jousting. <laughs> um where you're trying to time having your shark you know hit home plate at the right time when the pitch is reaching there to stop and whip up and you know hit the ball and then at this point the ball is in play right so i wanted to figure out you know i figure fielding we'll figure that out the guys are on sharks they can move fast enough they move plenty fast we'll be good how does shark base running running base swimming i guess 
compare to to just you know MLB base running. Um, and conveniently, this is something that now Major League Baseball actually tracks. They they have you know fancy cameras and stuff where they can track everyone's everyone's speed, and they actually keep a leaderboard every season and say you know everyone's average speed. Well, basically the way they measure it, they look for the fastest one second window on like what they call uh, competitive plays. So plays where people are actually, you know, running flat out. I like how they're running. Like baseball is so low, slow paced that their running statistic has to have like an asterisk to be like, you know, when you're trying. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it's it's very funny, but it's also incredibly true. <laughs> but the speeds are, are um, like 15 to 20 miles per hour. Um, and the average is around 18 and a half. The fastest in 2020 was Tim LaCastro of the Arizona Diamondbacks, who had an average speed of just 21 or, or, or just under 21 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. It's actually, you know, kind of terrifying that people can move that fast. Um, but, you know, like I said before, the, the average speed of a shark is around 30 miles per hour, which is a little over that. Um, but I figure that that we can probably, you know, maybe tweak the placement of the bases a little bit and make that work. So it still works out with all the, you know, throwing speeds and everything and basically i think that's kind of it i think that what you probably do is is uh each base is now like a ring the shark sort of swims around in and then you know once the ball's in play it you know bolts out to the next one but that's how you get around the shark still having to to move all the time thing and i mean personally i would a hundred percent watch shark baseball yeah (laughs) you you are not in the minority (laughs) my friend i feel like this is probably a pretty easy sell for people right like I mean, if nothing else, it's on Shark Week. It could definitely be a Shark Week thing. Is this the same idea that you had like a few months ago? Yes, this is a hundred percent the idea I had a few months ago. Okay, this is this is a hundred percent. It was just making baseball better by making them move more by putting them on sharks. I'm glad it didn't get a waste. Me too, because it's a great idea. We should do it. We should. Uh, and apparently, also, I will say that I did I had, see. I had... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say I had I just googled the thresher shark because I was like, what does that tail actually look like? Because I had trouble picturing it, and it was not what I expected. It's just like a regular shark fin, but only the top half of it just like right. It just keeps pulled. going, <laughs> like it's pulled like silly putty. It look it looks like like a third grader just drew it poorly. It's like another just poorly drawn shark. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> just it's just if you drew a shark and on the top of the back fin, it just kept going as long as the shark is. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> It's wild. And I will say, thresher sharks apparently are actually pretty docile and not actually that dangerous to people. So maybe it could work. Same with megamouth sharks. There, there you go. The coolest looking sharks are actually the the least deadly. You know, the more you know. So anyway, that's my idea: is is shark baseball, and I think it's a winner personally. I mean, I think it's. I would watch the heck out of it. So it's good. Yeah. There we go. And now that we're sponsored by Shark Baseball and have created a new major league sport. I think we are complete successes. We'll come back. I guess we'll come back and do the Would You Rather, right? Yeah. We. I guess we'll finish this podcast before we cash in on our, our billion dollar idea. This one, this one may require a little bit of, uh, of figuring out how we want to do it. But, Chris, are you ready for a Would You Rather? Yes. Would you rather sense danger or sense money? Hmm. I feel like I'm not often in danger i'm not often in money (laughs) (laughs) that's the joke that i was considering making so i'm glad someone else made it instead well yeah so that means that the obvious choice is money right because i don't need to sense danger i'm never around danger but i money is good so so here is the question is what does it mean to sense money yeah so that's kind of the question and and i think even like the, the shitty version let's say is you can sense the presence of physical money I guess that's not very useful. <laughs> it's not. Would be one. And the other one being, you can sense when something is like a money-making idea. Like, if you do, you can sense when if you do something, you'll make money. Right. Like, if we're saying that sensing danger is sensing dangerous situations, you can sense money-making situations. Yeah. That makes it closer. All right. No, that makes it easier to decide. That makes it pretty obvious, I think, the choice. Yeah. I'll say this. If it's the shitty version of the sensing money, I'm still considering it because there's probably quite a bit of loose change and loose bills and loose money around that will ne- you would never find. But if you would be able to pick all of it up, like if you were just like on full on, you know, mail detection all the time, you might come away with like a healthy amount of it. Also, think about how great it would be if like, you know, you go to like, you know, 
the beach on a weird day where it's it's just you know old dudes with metal detectors they're all walking around and you're just walking around to yourself and every, every once in a while you stop and just bend down and scoop up some money that was just you know buried and it's just like you have no metal detector you just you know do it and i'll just like what is this guy doing how is he doing this he's so lucky you just aggressively punch your hand like four inches down on the and sand and like rip boom, up seven coins, coins. yeah <laughs> that'd be cool be pretty cool i wonder how much money you could like get if you just like stroll down like a city block see i don't really want coins though coins are a pain to deal with i don't want coin. i i guess people drop bills and stuff and the bills are good but i feel like people drop coins more you never lose your wallet true but i don't keep that much cash in my wallet <laughs> but enough to sense I imagine if you're picking up pennies you can find your wallet I never, I don't, I don't really lose my wallet that often. <laughs> That's also true. Yeah. So let's look, let's look at the other side of the, co- of the proverbial coin anyway. Um, so sensing danger. So Chris, you said you're not in danger a lot, but when you are in danger, it's really good to be able to sense it. I'm trying to think of the last time I was in danger. Like low frequency, high impact skill there. Like, for example, if you sense that random railroad track was dangerous, you wouldn't have broken your ankle. Mm, That's true. That was once in like 20 years (laughs) but it's a good once if it stops you from dying once it probably pays for itself (laughs) seems dece how how sure are you that something's your dangerousness and not just like you ate a weird burrito or something like how well same thing for the money then (laughs) right i guess it's pretty easy to prove the money thing if you if you eat at an airport chilies and your stomach is rumbly are you th- going to think your plane's going to go down? Like, that's kind of what I'm wondering here. Let's say it's like very, like a very specific tingling. Like, like it's like spidey oh, sense. Okay. Yes, it's in your nether regions. Ah, well then. Show me the money. I'm going to become a risk taker. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you're basically describing spidey sense. Yeah. I guess I don't know how, how much money you're actually going to make. And I think that the payoff, like if, if the danger sense pays off, it's obviously very, very good. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of where I'm leaning. Let, 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 let's, let's, let's do our finals yeah. here. I think I'm going to pick the danger sense, although I will say I would love to be the guy that just, like, it, you're just hanging out with for a day and just, like, spending a day together and just, like, you just, like, multiple times throughout the day, like, find money somewhere. Right. Because that would just be, like, a fun little, like, reputation to have because that's just, like, a funny thing. Like, yep, I just find money all the time. But, yeah, I'm going to pick danger, danger sense. I am also going to pick danger sense just because I don't, I don't think you're going to find that much money. I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just, you know, I would, I'd rather have one good payoff of the danger sense than like getting, you know, $6 on day, a day or something from finding random bills and washing machines. I think I'm on the same page as you guys. I don't think you're going to find that much money. I think when, when you do find money, it'll probably be coins or small bills. I don't want the coins. I'll probably just ignore the coins. The small bills are nice. They're, it's a nice pick me up for your day, but it's not going to change your life. Whereas the danger thing will probably save your life at some point and maybe you'll save other people's lives. You could actually, maybe you could make like an act out of it and like put on a show. I don't know exactly what this act would be. I don't know how that would work. (laughs) Like behind this door is a bear or behind this door is a bunny. Which one am I going to choose? I don't know which one is which. Okay. If you want to do something, you could actually do a really impressive Russian roulette bit yeah true so yeah you can make an act of that and make money so um i choose danger or scenting danger shoot i just realized you could potentially sense lottery tickets but i'm not going to go into it we're going to end the episode <laughs> instead <laughs> i don't think lottery ticket counts as money it counts as the chance to for money yeah well like i said i'm not going to go into it well i went into it <laughs> but what i am going to go into is uh stuff about helping us the podcast because if you want to help us out if you enjoyed what you just listened to let everyone know you listen, that you enjoyed it. One, tell your friends. Word of mouth. Awesome way to grow the podcast. Two, tell the internet. You can leave a review for the podcast, and that is a super awesome thing to do. Three, you can tell us directly with your money by going to www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals and clicking on that Become a Patron. One dollar gets you access to our behind-the-scenes episodes, which are awesome and great, and there's plenty of them, and you get access to all of them for just one singular dollar a month we can't sense the money so you have to give it to us directly yeah exactly and we can't sense the danger either so if you send a a scary dollar we won't know that it's coming so that you have that option you have that power use it responsibly dollars (laughs) 
<laughs> it's not Shark Week and it's not Halloween. <laughs> But yeah, in any case, whether you give us your spooky dollar or not, you are more than welcome to join us next week, where we stay on the sea-themed questions with, which turtle would win in a fight? <laughs>